Odometry is a form of navigation where a robot or autonomous vehicle is able to detect changes to its own position. What it describes is the general process of using motion sensors of any type to detect displacement from a starting point. In particular, the use of encoders in odometry is a fascinating open problem, one which I believe is well worth the meaningful time needed to delve into. This series is going to be split into four parts, where each part expands upon the topics introduced in the previous. Be warned, the latter two videos do get somewhat mathematically involved, but rest assured that everything comes from a simple place, so I implore you to try to intuit the principles introduced in these first two videos in order to make that transition into harder math as natural as possible. For now, let's start with the basics. Odometry, as it's commonly used in robotics, is the problem of localization with data collected from a very specific type of sensor array. This array consists of three encoders reading the rotation of three non-driven omni wheels in the configuration shown, where the left and right wheels roll in the forward direction of the robot, and the third auxiliary wheel rolls perpendicular to it in the strafe direction. The idea here is that as the robot moves, these wheels roll against the ground. Using dead wheels with encoders to track their movement, we can effectively track the robot's position. In order to do anything with the data from these wheels, we first need to isolate a few important quantities from it. Robot motion can essentially be broken down into three types, forward motion, strafe motion, and rotational motion. Every way for a robot to move is some combination of these three movements. To isolate how far the robots move forward, simply take the average between the left and right wheels. This works because when rotating, the motion of one wheel is cancelled out by the reverse motion of the other, meaning there's no net change. But when moving forward, they compound. Additionally, the left and right wheels don't rotate in the robot's strafe direction, so it will naturally be independent of this motion. The same line of reasoning can be used to find that the rotation is equal to half the difference between the wheels, then divided by the radius of the robot, which in this case is the distance from the center of the robot to the left and right wheels. To find the distance strafed, however, you need to consider the aux wheel. The aux wheel is affected by two types of motion rotating, and strafing. To isolate the distance the robot has traveled from the aux wheel rotation, you need to subtract off the component of this wheel's rotation caused by the turning of the robot, multiplied by some proportionality constant depending on how far from the center of your robot your aux wheel is. This is great. Using the data from these three wheels, we found a way to determine the distance moved forward, strafed, as well as the rotation of the robot. Now, before we move forward into the algorithms with general use cases, I want to examine a thought that is wrong, but also helpful. When pondering the problem of using this information to localize your robot, you might think to use the forward and strafe distances from the robot as the actual coordinates. Now, of course this is flawed, but the question to ask here is, with what standard do you interpret these values as coordinates? Depending on which cardinal direction you associate with your robot's forward direction, you have four different sets of equations to choose from when translating between robot movement and coordinates, and no real way to choose between them. You might think to align your robot's forward direction with the y-axis, since this is how you traditionally orient it. However, as it turns out, the most conducive way to think about it in the service of this problem, and control systems in general, is to align the forward direction with the positive x-axis. To show why this is the case, let's say you have some vector representing the direction your robot is moving. At an angle of zero, the vector is facing in the positive x direction. In order for your robot's forward direction to be associated with an angle of zero, it needs to be the same as this vector. Therefore, as counterintuitive as it may seem, it'll end up being easier to think of moving in a direction of zero degrees as moving in the positive x direction. With that in mind, let's look at some cases for this model. As you can see, as long as the robot is facing towards zero, this model accurately predicts its displacement. However, when the rotation isn't at zero, the estimate diverges almost immediately. Why might this happen? Well, this is because it violates the assumption these equations are based on, 
that the robot is aligned to the x-axis. Your first thought might be to simply reframe the problem by transposing the robot so it's facing in the correct direction. But there's an interesting subtlety here. The relative nature of angles allows us to do something a little wonky. Hats off to you! We can also transpose the coordinate plane itself to align with the robot. These different orientations of the coordinate plane are known as headings. The local heading is the space in which the x-axis is horizontal, and the global heading is where the x-axis is aligned to the forward direction of the robot. Switching between these headings manifests itself in rotating the space itself. The issue from before was that we were interpreting a vector in the local heading as a global heading vector. To fix this, we simply rotate the space such that the x-axis aligns with the robot, then observe where the vectors land. The mathematical process for rotating a vector isn't immediately obvious, and there actually are multiple ways of doing it. We'll examine this idea in greater depth later in the series, but for now, you can use any of these formulas to achieve the desired effect. Syntactically, we'll denote vectors in the global heading with an asterisk superscript and vectors in the local heading without one. Despite this correction, however, there still are many cases which cause our estimate to diverge. As you can see, with this generic robot path, the estimate quickly diverges from the actual position. In order to improve upon this, we have to ask ourselves, at what point did we make an assumption which reduces this model's predictive capability, and how can we use our understanding of robot motion to produce a more accurate model? The answer is that throughout this process, we never considered what would happen if the robot's rotation changes as it moves. In this example, every single point along the robot's path is associated with the rotation independent of its tangent. While we were correct in considering forward and strafe movement, we neglected to consider how changes in the robot's rotation change the way they need to be understood. You might think to try setting the heading of the path to the robot's heading continuously. After all, one assumption we made before was that the robot's heading would always remain constant, when in reality that wasn't necessarily true. But as you can see, this approximation tends to be even worse, fluctuating wildly as the robot spins faster. So that begs the question, how do we incorporate the robot's rotation into our estimate correctly? Well, after some thought, you may come to realize that the mistake we made was that we applied the rotation intrinsic to a point to the entire estimated path, when in reality, it only corresponds to its respective increment. This means we can only apply the rotation to its associated segment of the path rather than the entire path. The key insight is that what we're doing here is exactly the same as the method from before, but repeatedly and on a much smaller scale. This means that rather than using the sensor array to measure overall forward and strafe distance, we're now looking at the changes in these values. Just as before, we use these values to find the change in forward and strafe distance, combine them to approximate a displacement vector, rotate the approximation of the global heading, and add it to our path. This process runs concurrently to the robot's actual motion and continually updates its position as it changes in real time. The theory is that as the number of vectors with which a path is approximated increases, the resultant vector aligns closer and closer to the actual displacement. However, practically speaking, the rate at which we can actually read and process our sensor data is limited by our hardware, and therefore we'll have to settle with a finite update rate and a finite number of vectors. Now, I want to point out a couple things. Although we've improved our model significantly since the beginning of the video, it still has the obvious flaw that robots obviously don't move like this. What our model is technically suggesting is that the robot instantly turns in place, 
moves in a straight line, and then turns again. Although we've designed this algorithm to approximate real-world paths, there clearly seems to be some grounds for improvement. Even when trying to move in a straight line, a robot will always diverge a little bit, and you'd be hard-pressed to try rotating in place without drifting a little bit as well. But in the same way we re-evaluated old ideas to come up with better ones in this video, we'll continue to analyze and improve our models moving forward. For part 2, I plan on going over how to express some of these ideas formally in terms of more general mathematics.